What is going on, everybody? Uh, the Badgers outlast and uh, just out ugly a Nebraska team for a gutty win. They are bowl eligible. We have a ton to talk about, including some really interesting coaching decisions from Jim Leonard. Take your user comments. We'll see what's going on on Twitter. We got a ton on today's show. Uh, live reaction show, Badgers Wisconsin, Locked on Badgers. Let's go. You are Locked on Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to Locked On Badgers. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Herrings. Really do appreciate everybody tuning in, everybody watching live, all the comments we're getting. Uh, we're going to get Justin and uh, Adam onto the show here to just kind of react to a very interesting game in a lot of ways. Uh, but first, today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Sign up on underdogfantasy.com with promo code Locked On. And get your first deposit doubled up to one hundred dollars. Uh, let's get into it. Let's bring Justin in. Let's bring Adam in. Both have been on the show a long time. We're gonna get our comments up. Um, I see Chris, Jordan, Ben, tons of people in the comments. We're gonna get to all of this. But first, guys, how are we doing? I'll let you go first. <laughs> yeah, let us know how to feel because I'm not sure. So here's here's what. Uh, Oh no! Well, oh, I'll look. dive in if they, if you want to know how I feel how I feel about it. Let's I'm take it. Happy yeah. we, I'm happy we won. I this was a really unimpressive effort today. Like this is a team. Nebraska's just not good. Like this is a game we should have won comfortably. I'm and we're talking like two touchdowns or more. And the, that was what the actual point spread was at. We had to find a way to get back into and win this game against a team that has no business being on the same field with us. Can I interject really quickly and then want to kick it to Adam? We're not good either, though. <laughs> like I We're not. bad, but we are also but, not good. But, like, the baseline that we've set in previous seasons, we are so dramatically underperforming that even. It's like I, I expected growth during this this period where Leonard took over, like we would straighten some things out and we'd start to look stronger as the season's going on. We're looking worse. Like our, our high point was Northwestern. We have progressively gotten worse and worse each week. And it seems like the kids just mind is not as on football. And I realized there was the Devin Chandler thing that happened this week. So that, that messes with kids heads a little bit, but man, we just seem, we just seem like we are not focused on football at all. Like guys just, don't seem locked in. And I look at it this way. We're, we're looking at the season and, and what's going on here. And it feels like the leadership people that are on this team are not a hundred percent bought in. And it feels like that's kind of, you know, rolling downhill with everybody. I don't know if that's what you guys are feeling, but that's kind of how I feel. Cause it feels like the people that are leading are not, you know, having that, that, Leo Chanel kind of attitude that you want on the field. I have some takes on that, but I want to kick it over to Adam. The energy level certainly has taken a dip, especially since the Northwestern game and even the, you know, even the Michigan state and Purdue games where, you know, they were, they were getting up and everything. It just today, they just seem like we're here, you know, <laughs> and that was basically what they were doing. I thought the play calling was really bizarre today i did not understand why we're screening against a team that doesn't have much of a pass rush early it was like why are we getting so cute with this like make nebraska prove we were... that you need to throw a screen pass i don't know before. why we were passing at all we were running so well and once well, again the rpo just non-existent again yeah the that's second gone. half they were running you know you could have told them where they were running and wisconsin mm -hmm. was going to be successful why mm -hmm. would you throw a pass at that point yeah. Yep. Three other running than backs Braylon Allen. Well, yeah. It is three running backs all over. To your point, Adam, three running backs all over 4.7 yards per carry, 250 as a team. I thought this was the best offensive line performance that we've seen this year. Granted, mm -hmm. Nebraska is not good. I, I get that. But Nebraska also knew we were running the ball and they were able to push him around. I want to go back to Justin's earlier point because I think it's interesting. I actually think today was kind of a spot where some of the leaders stepped up. Like I've been critical of Braylon Allen. <clears throat> like in, in, just because expectations are so high for him, like it's it's all relative. Uh, but I thought he was battling today with a bunch of injuries, and he was running harder for the most part, especially in the first half until that guy landed on him. But I was pretty impressed with his toughness. And then 
if we're talking leadership defensively, Benton is such a dude, and you see how fired up he is. Um, two tackles per loss today. Well, that, that's what I, that's the point I was making. Out of the guys that they have, there's two guys that I can legitimately look at and say these two guys are fired up and are bringing it all the time. That's Benton and Herbig. Those yeah, are the two guys that are totally too. about it. I think Atorchio, Kamoi, Latu have been pretty amped up most of the year. I don't know how they're – well, Torchio, I, I would agree with. Latou, I don't know if he's necessarily a guy who's looked to as a leader yet just because he's new blood. I um, Yeah, the, I think the lines played – both lines on either side of the ball played very well. Yeah. But what, what I came out of there thinking is, you know, I'm kind of an optimist. So <laughs> I, I came away thinking, you know, how many games over the past few seasons have we seen – Wisconsin lose games like this. They were down two possessions in the fourth quarter on the road, and they had nothing going on offensively, but they were able to dig deep and find enough to win. Yes. Mm-hmm. And how many times have we seen Graham Mertz go from, you know, he's gone from good and stayed good or been started good, went to bad, but we've never seen him go from bad and turn the switch and turn positive. That's a great and point. He he had a really bad first half, but that should be touchdown pass to Chimray DK. That was an incredible throw, and it mm-hmm. was just dropped. And I I he I mean it was a tough well. catch. I don't. There's yeah. people that were begging on on DK for that, and I'm like that's that's incredibly it, difficult it was to a make outstretch like that. He's got to catch it though. Still, he right? Does. If you're he does. But if you're if you're a number one receiver. You have to make that catch. You have to make that but catch. Name, but name a quarterback since Russell Wilson that would a even attempt that pass or b make it possible for someone to catch it. <laughs> I mean, I thought, Cordy Brook couldn't do it. Stop it. Wouldn't do it. Yeah, the receivers in general had I thought an underwhelming game. And we've listen. Justin's been high on receivers. I've been high on receivers. But uh, Skyler dropped a pass that he has uh, yeah. to catch. I DK really like the pass I really that he like Skyler's talent level but he is definitely showing that he's a young receiver throughout the season like there's a lot of i'm not i'm not focused plays that happen with him where it's like that's a catch you gotta have see i don't know if it's a focus i mean yeah it is focused in a sense for sure but i think you might just not have great hands like in that that, that's that's just who you are as a player for a while but dk dropped at least two passes Mm -hmm. no one of them was a hard one i mean neither one were easy catches but like you have to catch the ball if you're the number one receiver and you've a struggling quarterback. It's one mm-hmm. thing if you have a great quarterback that's going to pick himself up, but well, if your aspirations are NFL, those <laughs> are catches. Both of those are catches you have to make. Yeah, I want to let's. I want to finish our come here. I have a bunch I want to talk to about. Or talk about. Um, I want to start with what I thought was a, a interesting coaching decision. I just want to get your guys' take on Jim Leonard going for two, done fourteen to nine. There was 10 minutes left in the game. They had just scored a touchdown, so it was 14-9. to nine. You kick the field goal, you're down four. You go for two, you're down three. It didn't work out. Um, regardless of whether it worked out or not, did you all like that call? I did. I did. I, I like the aggressiveness. That I mean, I, I'm going to err on the aggressor side because of what we're, we've gotten used to and how little it's worked. So if it's more aggressive, norm, unless it's like out of control, I'm going to. I'm going to be for it. My fear was that it potentially would have taken us out of the ability to win the game or t- keep it tight. Like, cause they effectively, we were setting it up that if they would have scored a field goal, we're the game's over. Like we were, we were putting ourselves at risk for potentially not being able to win the game with the way things played out. Like we would have had to hit a two point conversion just to get to 17. Yeah. And it's like, geez. Ugh. See, I think I- I think Leonard was looking at it, and I, th- I think this is one you could go either way. I really do. I think you can make an argument uh, either side of it. I agreed with the call because I felt like Leonard in the back of his head was saying, if we go, if we get the extra point, we're down 14 to 10, I don't believe our offense can score another touchdown. Right? So he was he was playing to get the field goal and maybe sending it overtime. Um, and I get that because I didn't think we would score another touchdown either, Like yeah. to be completely oh, honest. Yeah, the offense was awful for the bulk of this game. Like – at some point, I realize we've had bad conditions for the last several weeks, but other teams are finding ways to fight through it, and we're just not. Like, we are completely run the ball or nothing, mm-hmm. and we haven't been able to run the ball great this year. Um, the passing game has been a terrible. Like, he's what is he the last three weeks? It's well under 50%, isn't it? 
Oh, it's way under 50%. When you, yeah, it's been three bad games in a row for Mertz. Now you can write off the Maryland one if you want, but Iowa was terrible. He was eight of 18 and our, yeah, eight of 18 in this game. You can see the ticker below us. So it's been three subpar games in a row. I do want to point out, um, I agree with Adam. Like he did respond at least that touchdown. Yeah. Point. I mean, we'll that back. we don't normally get that from him. I will agree with that. If he's bad, he's normally just bad the rest of the game. Like I, I kind of brought this up in the chat uh, while we were talking about post game is that some guys, get overstimulated when things start to break down and they just, they get tunnel vision and they just don't know what to do with the ball. Mertz is one of those guys. Like he, he clearly everything closes down and he sees the game like this and he sees the one guy and he'll throw it be damned. If he doesn't see a defender, there may be two lurking. He just doesn't see it. Yeah. Now that's something that you can coach out of a little bit just as guys get experience, but that's more of an intangible ability that the great ones have. And I just don't think that that's a strong suit of his. So when we get a game with a a good defense, he's really struggles. I think he gets, I think he gets too much. I want to, we have to take a quick break. No, no, you're good. You're good. I I, I just have to take a quick break, Um, but I want to get into that more coming up. Plus we have user comments. Plus we're giving away a Brett Moss autographed rookie card. Um, Just kind of in honor of, you know, the, the dude, it just happened obviously. So, we have a trivia question coming up to win the Brett Moss autographed rookie card. A bunch more comments coming up. I want to give Adam a chance to talk to about Graham Mertz a little bit more. Uh, but first, today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Um, Underdog Fantasy is the easiest way to continue spicing up your college football weekend. It has tons of parlays. You can parlay two to five different players on different teams in different sports. So you could take a um, Chucky Hepburn over 14 points and parlay that with a Braylon Allen over 100 yards. Mike does it on our Discord all the time. Different teams, different players, parlay them and win cold hard cash after a single day. It's a lot of fun, easy to use. Their help staff is is incredibly helpful if you get stuck trying to figure something out. You can get it set up in the same day, easy to play while it's not overly distracting and take a ton of work. Um, Available in over 30 states, and it's, again, just one of the easiest fantasy games out there to play. Uh, Sign up with the promo code Locked On. That's one word. And Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. You deposit $100, they give you $100 for free. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code locked on. Get in on the college football pick em action today. I want to thank everybody for tuning in to Locked On Badgers, continuing to make this one your first listens every day. Really, really do appreciate everybody listening, everybody tuning in. Uh, if you're enjoying the show, hit the subscribe button, please. Uh, it just is an easy way to support us. But we're going to keep talking. Uh, a bunch more stuff we can get into here, a bunch more stuff I want to get into here. Uh, let's get Justin and Adam back on the show. Um, one of the things I do want to throw out there and I have it on the ticker, I'm going to take the banner off now because it could be distracting, but I wanted to give everybody the stats. Um, this propels Wisconsin to bowl eligibility, which I think I wanted two things with that. I want to kick it to you guys. A lot of people don't care about this portion of it. I actually really care about the fact that Wisconsin has the third longest active bowl streak in the country. From program program standpoint, I think that matters. It's like just proud fandom. And Mm -hmm. the interesting thing with that is they have the 10th longest streak in the history of college football. And they're about to jump a couple teams, by the way. That's really friggin' impressive. So Mm -hmm. that aspect of it, I love. But it's also going to give this young team, you know, two weeks worth of practices. So also important there. It does keep the bowl streak eligible. Do you guys care about that? Or is that not a big thing to you all? Gives me something to look forward to in December. <laughs> I, <go. laughs> I do. I think it shows consistency and not, you know, others. I think it reminds us how spoiled we are. I mean, we, we're looking at this there. They have a potential of going seven and five. And th- how much have we complained this year about this team? And they're going to be seven I mean, and five. It Nebraska, has been a very a very ugly seven and five. Yes. <laughs> I, I love you tell Nebraska, and Dustin is just angry no matter yeah. what right now. If you tell I, Nebraska fans you're going to be seven and five, they'll be like, yeah, please. And we're like, this is the worst season ever. This is terrible. <laughs> it is, I mean, it is a season that it is certainly underwhelming based on where we were. But I think if you look at it through the lens of when Jim Leonard took over, and I know, Justin, I think you disagree with me on this one, um, which is great. Like, I love um, chopping it up and seeing where we're at. I actually think if I, I think what Leonard has done here is actually relatively impressive because I have a hard time blaming him for the offense. Um, I just don't think that there's a lot he can do. And Wisconsin's going to turn in a winning season with the games Leonard has played, get to a bowl game. I think all those things are pretty good feathers in his cap. And quite frankly, again, I don't he can't change quarterbacks in the middle of the year. Really, he can't bring in a new offense coordinator. You know, the offense has been installed. He can't he can't change a lot of that. He's still coaching the defense. So. 
I think he's just managing the ship. And for the most part, he's managed it certainly better than Paul Chris did. Um, I, I think you disagree with me on parts of this, Justin. So I'm interested to hear your, your viewpoint, but I think it's a, a nice feather in Jim's cap. I'm not saying he's done a terrible job. I'm just saying that if what we're looking for is like, we're looking for whoever they bring in to be the coach for the next 10 years. And if, if that's the case, I wanted to see a statement after, after the switch over to Leonard to see this team seem to kind of get it together, lock down and then prove themselves over the course of the remaining schedule. And we haven't had a strong schedule to finish off this year. And it's like, we should be beating all of these teams like this, the Wisconsin of old, the, the team that we want to get back to being would have kicked the crap out of every team that we're playing against for the remainder of this year. There's not a good team on our schedule. I mean, that's fair, but this isn't the Wisconsin of old either. Like it's I not, don't think but, this Wisconsin team should be beating Iowa on the road. That's not a given with this, this team. Like it's just, this is not a good version of the Wisconsin. No, model. but, but I would have expect the, this team to have, given a better effort than what we got at that Iowa team. That's that fair. was an awful game. It, that was a low point. It, it's that in Illinois. I think we're going to look back at the season and, and, and we, think to be quite frank, point. we would have looked at today the same way. If yeah, they well, yeah. pulled a rabbit out of a hat, like losing to ne Nebraska, an epically bad team. And they really weren't impressive on offense. So again, we were potentially going to lose a game where the defense actually did pretty well. And where we're just, awful like at some point you have to start to get some kind of traction on the offensive side of the ball we're like the reverse iowa iowa seems to be making progress and at least getting competent and we're like headed in the opposite direction and getting worse on a weekly like benjamin season. button yeah. our offense is like <laughs> dying, like becoming a little baby we're climbing our back into is, the womb but, but our offense is forgetting how forgetting plays <laughs> yeah but let's get yeah. this right it's like forgetting how to snap the ball i actually think the running game Today, the running game there was there was a lot of grit and toughness with the running game today that I, I yeah, really I, I actually thought the line blocked per, fairly well. I actually, my opinion, Braylon Allen was the weakest of the three running backs. I agree. Um, I now thought he, Malusi he, showed really good vision and patience today, and I thought Garendo he was really close to breaking a couple of runs. There was um, a burst that Malusi had when he ran the ball that was really impressive. Yeah, every time he got it, Allen just seems so lumbering, and he's not he's not playing well. So just don't. Put him out there. Like he had 21 carries today. I would have been happy of keeping him at like 10 or 11 and splitting up the other carries between Malusi and Garendo. Yeah. And Monte D said the same thing. Ches and IG really stepped up today. Everybody knows how big of a Garendo guy I am. The, th the thing with Allen is he's just hurt. And at some point, it's on a coaching staff to say, because Allen, you have to and give him credit for at least playing hurt. Uh, I do. The coaching staff has to pull the reins back a little bit and say, hey, like this version of you, your full version of Braylon Allen is awesome. This version of you needs a few less touches, and that's okay. That's not on you. Like you've proven your toughness. It's not It's not a knock. We have to get Garenda, who is, again, a 220-pound lightning bolt, more touches. Well, not only that, but he's a guy with a bad shoulder. Do we really want to end up pulling him out of a game because he fumbled because of said shoulder? at one of these points, because that's where it ends up feeling like this is going to go where he loses strength in that shoulder and ends up in a really bad moment, say against Minnesota this next week, fumbling the ball and blowing like in a major moment in the game. Mm -hmm. And Chris, he Hart's was more Braylon. Yeah, Manley, sorry. Of his shoulder. All right. Yep. Sorry, Adam. Yeah. He was more Braylon Allen today than he was against Iowa. Yeah. Um, he actually ran into some tackles instead of running away from them. Sometimes it, actually most sometimes. of the time. <laughs> I agree. I mean, there was still some dancing, but yeah. yeah. There were a couple of times he backtracked, or I'm just like, you are not the guy that backtracks. Little 130 pound scat back and try to find their way to bounce off the edge. You go forward and just plow and get the two to three yards. Like, whatever you get, even if it's just a yard, I'll take positive over, over dancing and losing yardage every time. Mm hmm. Let's let's go on to a couple other things quick. Um, a couple of things I just want to touch on. I want to make these a little quicker, just a uh, little rapid fire, because we have a bunch of comments we still want to get to. Um, good call or bad call, and how bad or good of a call was it, the uh, Nick Herbig penalty? Go ahead. I, I wasn't as upset with that, because if you're mad at that, you're more mad at the rule and not the call. Mm -hmm. I think the call was right. I think the rule is wrong. Uh and I was more upset about the roughing the passer a couple plays down. Stop jumping ahead, Adam. 
<laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't believe that was the spirit of the penalty. Like that when that rule was written, that's not what they intended it to be calling. When you see a guy who's who visually is rolling away from the tackle because he's trying to avoid the contact and you call it like like the the, the rule is meant for a guy that's launching and trying to just absolutely light right. somebody up. And that is not what he was trying to do in that moment. And it's like, like, come on. At some point we can look at something and be like, really? Yeah. Like there's it's so inconsistent with the way that that rule is called. I think uh, it's way past time that intent be factored into those calls. Yeah. Yep. Cuz uh, it's pretty 100%. clear in most of those calls whether the intent right. was to hurt somebody. Like a or couple not. weeks ago where who was a Garendo that got absolutely got Campbell yep. at Iowa game. Yep. Absolutely launched into him and that's like that is a targeting. That was a crown of the helmet launched into the guy. He's going down to the ground and defenseless. Like that was verbatim what you're looking for in that rule and nothing gets called and then here we have herbig basically trying to dive to the side to avoid it well, it's because it's it a quarterback called. right they'll they'll always call that i i agree with you that it brought probably by letter of the law to the correct call but that's certainly not the intent of how, why it was put in um the bruffing the, pa- the passer penalty i think we've we all agree that was a bananas bad call <laughs> uh, like that was completely trash brian pate chimes in the roughing the passing after was trash uh the Keontes lewis one was is was interesting where he caught the ball third down along the sideline he ruled it a catch and then ended up overturning it thoughts on that one i wouldn't have i wouldn't have had an argument necessarily whether they if they said that it, it stands i don't think it was definitely wasn't confirmed like it's hard to tell by the the angle they had whether he had the tip of his toe still down but I don't really have a problem with them reversing it. Like it was close enough that if, if they got a better angle at whatever they were seeing that his toe was up, it was clearly out on the other step. Mm. Yeah. I, I think if we're looking at it objectively, I think it wasn't a hundred percent. And with the call being a catch, I thought that was weird, but mm-hmm. I thought objectively it was more likely that his foot was in the air before mm. he caught yeah. it, but I, I don't think part- it was definite. I thought that was one of the calls where I think we all probably thought it should have been called a certain way, but because it was called on the field a certain way and you don't have definitive evidence, I don't know how you could, I don't know how you can overturn that without definitive evidence. Maybe they had an angle, in which case you have to show people. Mm-hmm. Like if you had a better angle, you have to show people that angle. Um, it's 2022. I mean, we we split the atom 70 years ago and we can't figure mm-hmm. out replay. Like we put a man on the moon in the 60s and like we were struggling showing a camera angle. Like it drives mm-hmm. me nuts. I mean, we've had che- cr- cheese in the crust of pizzas for 30 years. Like figure out replay. One it of drives the greatest me accomplishments nuts. made by man. Right. Those are my three biggest <laughs> ones. You notice that's like splitting the atom, moon, and cheese in pizzas. Um, have you right, wondered? Up. So, sorry. Have you wondered if stuff like that is the reason why the Big Ten isn't staying with ESPN while that and money? No, I, I don't. I think just those lower tier. Those lower tier games, the quality is just so poor. Oh, we're gonna get into that. That's that's every side, like yeah. every one of the channels, oh, they man. they they do as little as possible to put money into it, and it's basically like, hey, we have it on TV. That's all that matters. <laughs> we're gonna get into that too. Um, come up, we're gonna do our trivia question, giving away a free um rookie cards. I'll sign the rookie card from Brent Moss, a uh, great running back that recently passed away tragically at the age of fifty. That's coming up next. Uh, get ready to answer that question if anybody wants that card. A bunch more user comments to get into. That's what we're going to do mostly in the next segment. Plus, we're going to grade some of the offensive and defensive players. A lot more to get into. Uh, but quick, we have to take a break to for our friends over at Nugenics. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Nugenics. And I've talked about this before. Um, starting to get a little older, 39. I've been working in my barn, like redoing. I'm putting a basketball court in. So I moved some boards the other day and then I woke up and it felt like somebody snuck into my bedroom and beat me with doorknobs. Like I am just in pain. I'm 39. I'm getting older. And that's just how the it works. You get older, you don't feel like your younger self. And Nugenics is really um, one of those things I've started using to help boost your testosterone. And your testosterone is that that winning hormone that makes you feel like a warrior, right? It gets you back to really where you want to be. And Nugenics Total T free testosterone booster. Uh, helps to deny the aging process, which robs us of our testosterone. And the testosterone makes us feel stronger, leaner, more energy, more drive, more passion, which is better for all aspects of your life. Um, Nugenics Total T can help you energize your life, get you back to the powerful, confident, good-looking warrior you used to be. Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total T when you text college to 231231. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo, their most uh, powerful fat incinerator ever. 
Key ingredients help you get back into shape fast and absolutely free. Text college to 231231. Text college to 231231. Texting enrolls you in reoccurring automated text messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates do apply. Um, I do want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, I have a ton of fun on these shows, talking to people, chopping it up. We're going to get more comments in here. I really want to get some of these comments in here. Um, but first, I, while, I, while I pull up some of these comments, I do want to do the trivia question. right? Brent Moss, obviously terrible, um, passing, former great Badger running back. Here's the trivia question to get that free Brett Moss autographed rookie card just for free. Um, you don't have to pay for shipping or handling just as a way to say thank you for supporting the show. Seeing how we just played Nebraska, they haven't beat us since 2012. Can you name the two quarterbacks in that game that Wisconsin used to throw passes? The last time Nebraska beat Wisconsin, who are the two quarterbacks that threw passes for the Badgers in that game? First correct answer gets the autographed rookie card for free. No charges, no shipping and handling, no catches. I actually um, know we'll the monitor the comments for that. I know, Justin, you're not going to get that because your name blanks on name. No, I actually know them both. Oh, do you? That's all I <laughs> You got the card. Um, um, all right. Let's get into some comments. It is not Stave and Kurt Phillips. It is not Bart okay. Houston and Joel Stave. Am I um, eligible for this? Not Joel Stave and <laughs> Kurt Phillips. Y- y'all are getting one of them, but you're missing the second one. I know what the other one is. So right, let's I. get into a, a couple <laughs> questions here. Can I? Um, <laughs> I want to I want to get into the quarterback stuff. And Bo Dragon has a comment here. Um, the bad news is Mertz will be back for one more year because I I want to use this to frame the question I'm going to ask you guys. I had several people say you have to put Miles Burkett in. Is there any scenario in your head where you thought it was the right time to go with Miles Burkett or even Chase Wolf for that matter? I I thought so um, at one point, uh, but I think Mertz brought me back from the abyss. Um, but I'm also a Mertz apologist. <laughs> so sure. I take that with a grain of salt. Uh, to be quite blunt, I actually thought that it, would have, it wouldn't have hurt us to go for Cat. Like this is a game against a relatively harmless, harmless defense that I think it was worthwhile to take a shot with him. Um, I think the mobility would have helped a little bit. And I think that that's how you – He's he's got the skill set that you if you're using a young quarterback that you kind of are comfortable with because it's like hey if you don't see it take off and just don't do something dumb with the football you know run to the edge get the yardage you can throw it away whatever just don't randomly rifle it up downfield like we don't have a statue that's going in there which is a plus uh, Brian Page says the Iowa game was the right time for Burkett I actually don't think and I. I Said it during the game too. Um, Jordan Love era gets it right here, by the way. Uh, Stave and Daniel Bryan. Nice job, buddy. Um, <laughs> and the card will come your way. I actually don't think he was ever the time for Burkett. I just don't think he's ready. I don't think, and as bad as, listen, as, as trouble, troubling as, um, you know, Mertz has played, I still think he's going to be the more prepared player because he's had the practice time. He's more prepared in these games. He's more prepared to play on the road in moments like this. I just think you have to stick with Mertz this year and then you reevaluate in the off season. I think at this point, that's kind of what they're thinking. I just think that the offense clearly needs a spark and he's not playing well. Like at some point, like let's be honest here going into next year. Is he the guy that you think, do you think they should stay with him at the helm? Because to me, I think with based off what we've seen at the end of this season, if we're starting him again next year, then we're not putting ourselves in the best opportunity to be a, a good team. Hmm. I just I, I just don't see the ceiling there against good teams for us to truly compete if that's our goal. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I I've all for a long time I've thought Wisconsin has really jerked Mertz around in a way, and I'm not trying to put it all on. Listen, every player has some accountability here. Everybody could be a little better in any given situation, but. It's hard to expect a ton for him given the offensive system, having different play callers every year. He hasn't been great, but I still think there's a ceiling there that he hasn't quite hit. And I don't know who you're replacing with is the other issue, right? Wisconsin is not going to be a player for the highest level of quarterbacks in the transfer market. They're just not. So there's not an internal option that I think is better. It kind of puts you in a tough spot, in my opinion. Um, I think Mertz Mertz gets in his own head too much. I think when he's not thinking, I think when he's just playing, he is a very good quarterback. But you can see when he's playing, when there's a tough spot, when you know when he's playing against a he's defense like Iowa, himself that he's a, when he it's gets all upstairs, really. Yeah. 
Uh, but Derek when, he's, says, when he's just playing, when he's, you know, you need to get over this linebacker and between a safety and a cornerback, and he's not thinking, he can just throw it right in there. I think he puts I think he puts a ton of pressure on himself to oh, yeah. make plays against the better teams that we play. And what he needs to do is just take what's available out there rather than trying to make a big play all the time. He did it again today. Like we saw opportunities. There was that check down to DK who was wide open and he threw the ball up and he got picked on it because he he decided he was going to try to take the big play rather than the check down and it's like just take the easy one there. It was still yeah. 10 yards. That was a terrible play. Uh, Derek Bold says, Mertz isn't going to get better overnight. Another OC isn't going to fix him. And then there was another comment in here that I really liked um, from Badger and Bournemouth, by the way, who's been with the show really since the jump. So I appreciate all the support. Um, there are no more excuses for Mertz anymore. I just want to say with that, like, I I feel like I, it sounds like I'm making excuses for him and in a way I am, but I think there are also just reasons why he struggled. Like, I think there are legitimate reasons why he has been held back. And Mertz hasn't been good enough either, uh, but – not a lot of quarterbacks are developing in the ecosystem in which we have put Graham Mertz for the last four years. Oh, yeah, we, we went through this with Stave, who had a very promising freshman, and, and quite frankly, his sophomore year was pretty darn good. But he constantly was getting jerked around, and we saw what it did to him. His last two years were probably his two worst years. Yeah, and Muppy I mean, B says, get a transfer quarterback. Definitely agree there if you can. I think you have to no matter what. Yeah, they need depth. All right, Adam, I thought you were about to say something – Oh no, 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 no. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. So let's really quickly run through these. Um, I don't um we haven't done these a lot, but I'm just interested in where you are on this. And I don't want to necessarily grade individual positions. I want to grade groups. So grade the passing game. Let's start with Adam. Are we talking today's game? Yep. Today's or just game. in general. Today's uh, game, the passing game. Passing offense. game D plus. <laughs> D plus. I give it a D. I, I'd say D. Yeah. And not good. Grade the rushing game. C plus B minus. I think I'd go with a solid B. Yeah, I think I'm going A minus. I, I think it was really good, actually. Um, but this is why I like doing this. There's, there's disagreement here, which I love. Justin, why are you so low on this? They ran for 250 yards. They ran for 250 yards. Look what we have previously done to Nebraska on a, on a yards per carry <laughs> basis and a total yardage. So <laughs> this is kind of like this is the bottom of the list for that. That's fine. That's fair. Um, I mean, Melvin pass? Gordon ran for 408. So, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> on that scale, this, this he almost doubled standard. up our production for today. And that was a three quarters. There's the measurement right there. <laughs> right. On the, on the Melvin Gordon scale, this rushing attack was a. <laughs> That's very fair. I mean, he averaged, what, 16 yards a carry? Oh, so, clearly, he four times what we got today. Didn't four, he fumble zero. like eight times in that game, too? Or something like incredible. that? All right. Let's grade the rushing defense, uh, Adam. Uh, rushing defense, I thought A minus, A minus. They're pretty good. I, I would give them B plus. Um, yeah, they, there are a couple of little spurts that they got on us, but nothing that really hurt us. I would say A minus again. I thought they really controlled the trenches. How about the passing mm -hmm. defense, Justin? Uh, I would give a, that a B plus. Um, I minus the touchdown pass where it's just the guy it had to have been a broken coverage because there was just nobody there. They were pretty good in coverage for the most part. Yeah, I think I'm going to agree with the B+. Plus. I thought they did pretty well, but there were a couple missed coverages that were really tough in a really bad spot. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say C+. Plus. I, I thought the broken coverages, like you just can't, especially that one down the middle, you just can't give open passes at the end of a game. That that was almost a game ender, quite frankly. Um, and then I thought the pass rush was inconsistent. At, at times it was really good, and at times it really let Thompson out of the pocket, which mm -hmm. you just you have to contain him a little bit better. So I... I would say, yeah, C plus. Definitely not terrible, though. Um, Thompson also coming off an injury. I, I expected them to be a little tighter in coverage and make it a little harder for him. How about special teams? Hmm. <laughs> They're just, just laughs. What's the, what's the laughing? Well, I, I did see Dean Ingram actually have a return today, which was a, a pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. It was like eight times his, his a average. What was it, like twelve yards? So yes. <laughs> and we saw a thirty-nine yard field goal miss short. That was a new one. Yeah. <laughs> he hit that square too. <laughs> Thank you. That. Oh, Gagley and Oni would have hit that with his left foot. Maybe he should have just drop kicked it. <laughs> <laughs> Better shot. Yeah. It, I mean, coverage units were fine. Um, we, no punts were blocked. So that's a plus. Dean Ingram still misjudged a couple punts. Like he kind of bobbled one and picked it up. Like that's sketchy back there. Yeah. 
I'm going to say C minus, like, cause I think most of the aspects were solid, but you can't, you can't leave a 39 yard kick short. Yeah. <laughs> that is just, I don't wild. care how bad the wind is. You should be able to be from 40 in. That's, and, that's and Adam problem. says that that win though, yeah, it was windy. That was short from thirty nine. We're not playing in a game. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, let's let's talk about coaching. Coaching grade. I think this one's the most interesting out of all of these. Can I split it? Offense and defense. Out. Yeah, go ahead. You do. All right. You. Um, I would give defense a B plus. I would give offense. Oh, that's probably a D. Yeah, I. I think I'm going to go a little lower. I think I'm going to go with a C minus. I think the defense was just better because they're better. You know, I, don't, I think the quality, the quality of the roster on the defensive side just won the, won the day there. And I think offensively it was kind of a dumpster fire at times. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll go defense a minus. I think they once again, controlled the game offense D plus like, I mean, it was just pulling teeth, right. The mm-hmm. entire game, uh, but we're not finding a way to work around conditions like it's just you got to find a way to make things work and offensively we just we're not sustaining any type of drives really in games right even some of the things though so this is i want to get your take on this because even some of the things i feel like we're we're handicapped here um by the way i I, it made me laugh so i have to put it up here bo dragon says i like the fat kicker we had rafael Rafael gaglione um i know he means that in love because we all love Mm rafael gaglione uh, I miss him too. I like uh, he was he was a dude. Um, what I was going to say on offensive, uh, offensively, there's there's handicaps here and there's issues here. We aren't going to solve any year, like we talked about it. Inconsistent quarterback play, a young offensive line, um, inconsistent play calling. There's not going to be a new offensive coordinator this year, but there's still things I think we can do. You know, our our inability to get again, I'm beating a dead horse, but because I think it's an obvious one. Isaac Grindle more touches. You see him mm-hmm. sneak out for a 30 yard catch. He averages five yards a carry. Like get him more touches. Um, attack the middle of the field a little bit more. So much of what Mertz does is just, and Justin, you mentioned this on last show, like it's just deep out, deep out, deep out. I think there's more in the middle that could be had. Mm-hmm. Um, Jets. Well, that's why we said RPO. If like you're concerned about the linebackers, guess what? They know you're running the ball. Play action or RPO over the middle because the linebackers are going to get sucked up. Unless the safeties are crashing hard and picking up the your tight ends or receivers on that, you should have something there. Mm-hmm. I like your point, Ryan, that the, the jet sweep, we were in it once and it was successful. Why not play off of that? You don't have to, you don't have to do the jet sweep every time. Just show jet sweep, hand it off to Garendo up the middle or to the opposite side and, you know, just play with it a bit. I don't get it. It's like we ran it one time and it worked and Bobby Ingram's like, okay, that's enough of that one. <laughs> like That worked too well. well that's, what I, that's what I said during the game. I was like, it seems like, there's not a purpose to our play calling with Bobby Ingram right now. It feels like he's just kind of throwing things at the wall, trying to see what sticks. And it's like, what are we doing here with a lot of this stuff? Like, are we setting things up? It doesn't seem like our play calling is to get, you know, something set up. Like we're not throwing a double move on those outs. We're not seeing a guy, you know, suddenly break one up and and hitting a guy that's wide open on that. We don't have plays that we're running. Like we're completely neglecting the middle of the field. And you could, that could be as simple as Garendo coming out on a circle route. Like mm-hmm. you're not going to keep a linebacker on him. He's too quick. You I saw it today. Even, that's why that catch was there. I you think can't it's even put a four six. That. Even a fast linebacker that runs a, a four six is not staying with a four three guy. I think it's worse Three. than uh, throwing it at the wall and seeing if it sticks. Because even if it sticks, we're not running it again. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it's even worse than that. It's frustrating at times to to see the inability of a coaching step to just kind of adjust in game and go with what's been working. Um, a couple more comments here. These are off Twitter. Uh, Badgers, big boy football. This is from Big Cat. I apologize for downing Jim Leonard. Favorite Badger ever for a reason. Momentary lapse in judgment. Um, next one from Petroikis. This one I want to pause on. UW players want Jim Leonard hired as coach. Skyler Bell had best comment. I'm paraphrasing. We were just talking about in the locker room. What are they waiting for? What more do we need to do to get him? Again, that was from Jeff Petroikis. <laughs> Guys, how much of how much sway should the players have in this decision? Like how how much should their voices be weighed? Because I don't think it's zero, but I don't think it's the ultimate uh defining point either. I think it's some. Mm-hmm. I think it's a significant margin, but I don't think it's the end all be all. It's not even the most important thing. But I, I think, I think they're young it. kids who don't fully understand how to evaluate the entire situation because they're in it. And you have to look at the much bigger picture with it. And you can you can love Leonard. You can think that he's a, a good coach. But 
you're also kind of stuck in this and we are to an extent as fans but i consider you know myself to be one of the more people that's down to earth on this and the way of looking at it i like leonard there are questions there like there are questions about what he would do as a head coach that i have to legitimately ask because i don't know what his offensive philosophy is and where we would go with this do i know that that's going to be a positive turn of events for this team there are head coaches that we could bring in that we know that what they are on offense and defense that those questions are answered that's a good point um this is an interesting stat. Saturday was the first fourth quarter comeback win for the Badgers since the triple overtime affair against Purdue 2018. Both first ISO or games. Uh, every <laughs> quarter, yeah, it's been four years roughly since a fourth quarter comeback for the Badgers. That's well, that's when we sign. get down, we do not come back. <laughs> which which speaks to what the offense has been, right? Like mm-hmm. that makes sense. We haven't been able to throw the ball when we've had to. Mm-hmm. Like that makes sense. Um, that's still kind of a sad comment. Yeah, for this is forty. This years. one's interesting to me. Um. <laughs> This is from Jim Leonard himself. We are not far off. I think we got a little complacent. And I think some people took that to mean like in the game. I think he means as a program. I've tried to shake that up a little bit and see the way the players respond gives me confidence that I can get this done long term. Like, again, he just continues in the media to really push himself for this job, which I love, by the way. I think that shows a a level of confidence that you want as a head coach. Like, he's like, this is my job. I can do it. Um, Thoughts on this comment, not just from his his idea of like, I can do this in the long term, but like also – yeah, I think we got complacent. I, I've tried to shake it up. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't know anybody who can look at that and tell him that he's wrong. I, I think it's fairly evident that that's the case. Yeah, I, I mean, the, here's the thing. The questions that I have about Leonard are not going to be answered by what we're looking at here. Like, they're, they're large-scale questions that he would have to actually sit down and play out what he's going to be. We'd have to actually see what his lists are of coaches that he's actually wants to target and where he wants to go with things. Those are not things we as fans are going to get answers to until they actually happen. Mm -hmm. So it's the things that I would love to know from him about whether or not, like he's, he's passing every test in terms of what I could ask for him as a candidate. The question is, is what am I looking at in terms of other candidates? Number one, and obviously the questions that we don't know the answers to that that um, Macintosh is going to be the one that actually is going to hear the answers to. Like there was the, the not to not to talk about another podcast, but the Kenny and Halperin, they talked about how the coaching carousel moves fast. Listen, Leonard's already reached out to the guys that he wants. He's he's had these conversations back alley with whatever other coaches that he would bring in for offensive coordinator or any other positions that he wants. And he's telling those guys, if I get this, be ready if they're, mm-hmm. if they're interested. So you don't need to worry about that stuff. That's not a concern that this, that you're going to have as a program. If Leonard wants the guys and they're interested, they'll come. Yeah. I I'm, I certainly don't think you can rush the decision based on a coaching care. You have to make the right decision for yourself. Mm-hmm. And I've said for a long time, there's not a lot of data points on Jim Leonard as a head coach. So if I'm McIntosh, I want every data point I can get. And, I put a tweet out during this game that said, this is why you wait, because now we get to see him in a tight game on the road, make crucial decisions and how he handles it. And I'd like the two point conversion attempt, even though it failed. Like, so I think those are valuable data points for Chris McIntosh to sit back and say, I can really analyze this guy a little bit more tight game on the road. He pulled it out bowl eligible. I think those are all data points that are important. Um, And I'm glad that McIntosh has a vision here and he's, he's holding to it. I don't think people, a lot of people believe this is only a bureaucratic thing. I don't think this is simply a Wisconsin bureaucratic thing that they have to wait to post it and then they have to do a search. It could have already posted it. I think there's more to it than just that is my point. Well, one thing that we've noticed whenever Wisconsin fans get involved with the arguments, who do they always tend to put at the top of the list of people that we should hire at Wisconsin? It's always somebody that's a former Badger. Yeah. And that's not the mindset that you can have. If you're doing that, you're doing yourself a disservice. You need to take a look at whatever everything that's out there. It could listen, there could be an amazing division three coach, like a guy like Leipold was that would have come up that's younger and absolutely killing it. That could be a win. Like they may jump up somewhere else. I don't think Wisconsin will take that kind of risk, but that stuff happens. Like there are talented guys out there that haven't been given a chance yet. That could be the next Saban or you know Dabu Sweeney. You know, those are guys are that are out there. Those guys weren't those guys until they actually accomplished it. So you have to kind of keep an open mind and take a look at out, out there at what's all out there. Could Leonard be one of those guys? He could. 
do I know that for sure? I don't know that it's a it's a foregone conclusion that he's going to be an A plus head coach throughout his career. He could very well, like I said, if we get this wrong, there's two ways this go. We could have more of the same of what we had with Paul Christ, which is we end up falling into a, a lull of eight or nine win seasons where the fan base is frustrated that we're not winning the big games that we should be getting involved in, or we could just get worse. Like there's, there's a lot of varying degrees as to what could actually happen with this decision. If things are not, it don't end the way we want them to. I would love to see him blow it up and get us in playoff runs. And Leonard could be that guy. Like that's, mm-hmm. we just, I think people have jumped the gun a little bit with him because he is a Wisconsin guy and he's been a brilliant defensive coordinator. He wouldn't be the first brilliant defensive coordinator that fails as a head coach. Yeah. I'll just say that. Yeah. It, that's look a, at that's Oklahoma. The yeah. The the, the guy on the pedestal is absolutely crashing that program into the, the ground this season. Mm-hmm. I you spoke about it earlier or this week in one of your podcasts. I don't remember which day, but Wisconsin's a giant. We need to start acting like it. They're mm-hmm. you know, they're yeah. they got the money, they got the facility. I mean you know, falling apart facilities, but they have the facilities. <laughs> <laughs> They're putting money into them. Yeah. It will, yeah. will eventually get it done. There's just a lot of red tape at Wisconsin compared to other schools. But Being Wisconsin a state school to, is not advantageous. Wisconsin needs to act like a big 10 power they do. that they are. Yeah. I agree with that. I think there's way too woe is me with Wisconsin, mm-hmm. both administratively and from a fan base. We're you at know. worst the fourth best program in the big 10. Fifth, fifth once USC comes in, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, but even then, even then, if you're if you're the fourth or fifth best team in the the first or second best conference in college football, look, look at the look at the teams that you're sitting around there. Penn State and Michigan are the teams that are probably the two closest to what Wisconsin can be related to in the Big Ten. And you hear I, all these Iowa's things, probably getting close. Yeah. You hear all these things about how you know call it, the NCAA doesn't want Wisconsin to succeed or blah blah blah. And I'm saying, why not? <laughs> so much money. Was, NCAA was, would love Wisconsin to do well. I, I will mm-hmm. say this. Any fan that's getting that is Wisconsin's shooting itself in the foot. It has nothing yeah. to do with NCAA. Wisconsin is restricting themselves from, from fully buying into sports. There's nothing that's keeping them from a financial standpoint. The only th- You could argue footprint with recruiting to an extent, but I do think that that's become far more national over the last decade. Do I think they're, they can't, they're not going to gr- grab top 10 classes? No. Well, Wisconsin could be in the the fifteen to twenty five range consistently. Well, we and, had we had John Garcia on the show, Sports Illustrated recruiting director, who follows this stuff from a national perspective better than any of us, and he said Wisconsin every year should be a top twenty five ish class. You know, not doing why, that's a failure. Yeah, there's, why why has hasn't that happened? I mean, there's it, nothing stopping Wisconsin from doing what they did back in the day with Barry and saying, "Hey, we're going to have these five students or ten players you want to bring in." That will will let have some academic leeway. There's nothing stopping us from saying, yeah, we're financially going to play this like we want to be the the top tier of the NCAA. Wisconsin's, I, I believe, financially. Last time I saw it, they're like tenth or eleventh in revenue overall yeah. for for the N- entire NCAA. Our house. I I want to step back though because I think we're getting big picture right now, and that's yeah. partially my own fault. I, I do want. <laughs> No, 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 it's all good stuff. Like, it's all great conversation points. Um, um, but I, I want to go back to the Nebraska Wisconsin game just in, and wrap up there and see if there's any last thoughts. I, again, what's your big, biggest just in 10 years when you're going to look back, back at this game? What's if you could describe it in a sentence, a word, a thought? For me, it just it's going to be gutsy. And I know it's not a good team that we eat with Justin. Like, I get it. We shouldn't be happy to beat a three win Nebraska team by a point and struggle to do it. But this to me, this is also not a good Wisconsin team, and to go on the road and be down fourteen to three, like I thought it was over. And you, the one thing I would say is you have to give the players credit for for really fighting back into this one. That was on the road; it was senior day for Wisconsin. They won that fourth quarter, and I thought it was a it was a gutsy fourth quarter. Graham Mertz with that touchdown uh, run, the defense balled out. Uh, I just think it was a really gutsy performance, and I came away feeling pretty happy about it. The only thing I will remember from 10 years from now for this game will be that it made us bowl eligible. That's that's really the only thing that I'll remember because this game didn't have a lot to it that I'm going to look at and be like, that was a moment that was like, whoa. Like it was, just, there was a lot of just blah that I would like to forget. 
No, it wasn't a pretty win. No, no. gutsy doesn't mean pretty. No, <laughs> like, no, let's be real. Believe me, and believe me, I know that that's the case. We've seen a lot of gutsy Wisconsin wins over the last twenty-five years. I, teetering, I think, is the word that I would mm. I would say. Just teetering, because you could go one of two ways. They could build all this and you know play well against Minnesota, as my own dog is right here, um, <laughs> or they can go the opposite way and you know go the way of the first half. Mm, so. Yeah. It, it could go in either direction. So it's teetering. It, it, I'm very nervous. I'm very nervous about next week. Uh, as am I. Um, with that, everybody, I think we're going to kind of wrap it up unless uh, anyone has anything else. There's comments I didn't get to, which I, I apologize for. I was trying to get to them. This is kind of our new format we're trying to go with for live shows for everyone listening. Uh, we're going to avoid taking kind of call-in shows, but try to do more of the comments. I think it might make it a little cleaner. Um, so that's the way we're going to try to go with it. Um but yeah, Wisconsin wins, bowl eligible. Justin is is on the fence about how how great that is or not. The the only other thing that I'll remember from it is that burrito looked pretty good. Oh, it did. <laughs> Robert Griffin, yeah, eating a burrito on TV, talking yeah. about state sport. Now that's Nebraska. ratings, people. That is ratings. Listen, that's what happens when you have two teams with a combined eight wins playing late in the season. They're going to find things <laughs> to talk about. It's not going to be football. And quite frankly, Wisconsin's offense and Nebraska's defense and offense gave no reason to, to talk about the game anyway. So you might as well talk <laughs> about it for, you know. Uh, with that, everybody, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for dialing in, watching the show, listening to the show, participating in the show. We're going to throw up Underwater Man 7. Uh, get the axe back. It's, it's hate week. It's going to be axe week. Get that sucker back. Let's finish up with a with a beat down in Minnesota at home. Uh, with that, on Wisconsin, really do appreciate everybody tuning in, and we're going to talk to you again tomorrow. Thanks, guys. <laughs>